just emailed me a few minutes ago tonight uh, asking about how to design a a cabinet for to hold sustainers. Uh, so he's got a drawing that he's trying to work with. He doesn't normally work in the millimeter system and may not understand why. This is a an incremental sized uh, height based on 32 millimeter spacing for the shelf holes uh, plus a gap top and bottom to make it consistent. And we used to do this in the cabinet industry because we had uh, some a multi spindle a manual multi spindle machine that would drop down five or ten spindles 32 millimeter spacing and so you would base your end panels on 32 millimeter spacing plus an increment before you started that 32 millimeter crunch because sometimes you'd, you'd set down four or five move the panel an increment of 32 and then do another four or five so you had eight um, so anyway uh, to be consistent with his drawing we're gonna sh I'm gonna show you how to do this uh, and we're gonna get into it now Okay, so we'll start a new drawing, and I, I'm sorry, I just recorded this, but I didn't switch the uh, source to the monitor. So we'll do a new, new, new drawing. Do you want to save your changes? No. Okay, so I, I typically work in inches, so this can be 49 by 97 by three quarter of an inch so, as my starting setup, and I'll tell it okay. And then I'm going to go back to the materials, and I'm going to change it to millimeters. And this material, when I looked at his uh, setup, this, this is his overall view of what he was trying to do. This was what he sent me as a drawing, and I'm going to work off of it. So if I zoom in some, it's a sustainer setup. It's got the sustainer and T-lock sides, sizes, uh, pull-out drawers, okay, drawers with screws going into the 32 millimeter spaced systems. That's fine. We don't need to do the 32 millimeter spacing anymore. We just need to put them where we need them, and, you know, I use... I have customers using Cabinet Sense and CabMaker 32 and Mosaic and Cabinet Vision and things like that. And they can put it just where the hardware is. There's no sense in having extra holes necessarily, but I'm going to match what he has on his drawing. And this is an overall view. It's just the open box with pullouts. Be careful it could flip over and these will click in. And here's the drawing that we want. This is using 18 millimeter ply. Uh, the tops capture the sides. This, the depth is set at 380 millimeters deep. 8 millimeter spacing to the center of the first hole, then 32 millimeter spacing in the holes and 8 millimeter gaps, top and bottom consistent, great. Um, 58 millimeters from the front edge to the back to the center of the holes, and then 224 to the other ones. Now, the height can be up to, you know, however tall you want, um, but you would base that on the, the size of which size sustainers you want to put in this. So let's just say he wants to, comes out with the size, on here, or he wants to do a 36 inch tall cabinet. Well, we've got to figure out how tall this side is in metric equivalents of a 32 millimeter spacing with an 8 millimeter top and bottom gap. So how tall is that side going to be? Because it's not 36 minus 18 minus 18 millimeters. That wouldn't necessarily leave the 8 millimeters top and bottom. So what we do is we just jump to the calculator. And I'll turn that off because I've already got the values in there because I've already done this. We'll say 36 times 25.4. So say he wants a 36 inch cabinet roughly. 25.4 will give you the millimeters. That's 914.4 in millimeters for a 36 inch tall cabinet. So, okay, let's take that and divide it by 32. Uh, and so that'd be 28.575. So there'll be 28 sets of 32 millimeter spaced holes. Uh, so let's do that. So 28 times 32 plus the 8 millimeter top and 8 millimeter bottom. That's 912 mil millimeters. That's great. That's very close. That's 2.4 millimeters away from being a true 36-inch tall cabinet. That's less than an eighth of an inch. So that's what we want to want to use. That'll be our size for the height of the side panels. So I'm going to jump back into uh, VCarve, and we're going to let that go. That all looks good. Look, the thickness there, we're going to change it to 18 because... 0.75 is 1905, but we're going to use an 18 millimeter thick material. Come in here and do a um, 380 by 912 because it told us in the drawing 380 deep, and we decided to be 912 tall to be roughly 36. And I'll place it wherever I want, or I could say from the bottom left hand corner, come in 12 inch, 12 millimeters, 12 millimeters, and create it and put that in. Okay, and so that is the size of our end panel. And then what I do to do the guidelines is I'm going to just come to the guides and, and I'm going to create 
guidelines that we can snap to. So I'm just getting them close, and then I'll take this and get it right on the line, and it'll snap to it. And the same thing with this one. So that's on the bottom of the panel that I'm going to cut, my side panel, and that's on the, the leading edge. Now, if I get on this and click the guideline itself, I can hit the right button and make another one that's relative to that that is 58 millimeters away from it. And so it threw that one there, and that's great. And then I'm going to take this one, hit the right button, and say another one relative to that. But I want that to be 224. I don't remember the spacing. Let's look. Yeah, 224 millimeters. And create that guide. And that looks good. And so there's where my front holes are going to be and my back holes. Here I'm going to take this, and I want to, I want to go up 8 millimeters. What did I do there? I didn't, do, I didn't want that. So Control-Z to undo that. Edit redo. Right button. Oh, that it had absolute position rather than relative. So this made this one eight millimeters up from the bottom edge. I don't want that. I'll delete that guide. So I'm going to delete. Touch this guide, hit the right button, and delete it. Touch this guide, hit the right button, and do one that is relative to that guide up eight millimeters. And there we are. So at this intersection point, that's where I'm going to put my 5 millimeter hole. It'll snap to it, and I've got 5 millimeter in there. That's great. And then I'm going to do an array. So I'm going to take that hole, and I'm going to make 32 millimeter spacing of them. I'm going to make 28 rows and one column. So I'm just going to work up and down on this. So in the y, in the x direction, it'll be no offset, and in this direction, it'll be 32 millimeters. And I'll copy them, and boom, there they are. But now we'll, what we'll do is we'll see that we're actually one short because it was 28.575, so it should have been 29. Uh, so I'm going to undo that. And that's a mistake that you're going to make. I do it almost every time I do these. But it's a very, VCarve or Aspire are very visual tools. And that's beautiful because it helps you knock this thing out. And there it is. And then if I wanted to check this, I can come in here. And I can use the measuring tool from the center to this line. And oh, I missed it from the center. Highlighted that line. And it's 8 millimeters if we look at it. And I'll zoom out and come down to the bottom and do the same thing from the center to let's go, let it find the line. And then take it here and click. And yeah, it's 8 millimeters. So that's, that's our spacing. That's what we want. Uh, now, there's different ways. I could have set that up to do two rows with 224 millimeter spacing over here. I don't think that way. I'd like to get one row right uh, first, and then I can work on it. So I'm going to take this set of vectors now. They're all done as a group. And I'm going to do uh, Control-C, Control-V. This is just the way I think. And that copied it to the clipboard and then dropped another set of these circular vectors right on top of the first one. And it's got the top one highlighted right now. And I'm going to move them over in X, 224 millimeters, and that should put them right there on that line. To me, that works better than taking this first circle and making it a, a two-column spacing, 29 tall, with a spacing of 32 millimeters in Y and an X of 224. It can be done in one operation, but it's not the way I think. I, I prefer to do the simp simpler method first and then copy and, and, and move. So that's it. That's the left end panel. The right end panel is going to look just like that, except be reversed. It's going to be mirrored. So I'm going to turn off the guidelines. I don't need them anymore by clicking right here. And I'm going to take all of this stuff, and I'm going to group it together so that if I select anything, shelf holes, everything moves so that I can nudge this. I can, I can move the whole end panel around on the, on the table, uh, on, the, on the sheet. So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to um, mirror it. And just by looking at it, you can figure it out. But if you're wrong, you can just do and undo. You know. So I'm going to flip it horizontally. And it did it, but it dropped it right on top of the other one, just like the copy and paste. So it's there, and I'm just going to use the arrow keys and move it out of the way. And that's correct. So this is the front of the right-hand side, 58 millimeters to those holes, 224 from the front, 58. And that's this one. So easy to do. So now we're going to jump over to do the tool pathing. Um, before I do that, I need to be able to select the shelf holes individual from the 
perimeter cuts. So I need to ungroup them. So I'm going to hit select that. It took everything because they're grouped. I'm going to hit the right button and ungroup back to original layers. And the same thing here. And now I can take the shelf holes or shelf holes or hold down the shift key and get multiple shelf holes and the perimeter or the perimeter. Each set of, oper of, of vectors is independent of the others right now. Uh, I may want to group them again after I do all this. Um, after I set it up where I want it to be for nesting. So I'm going to grab this one. And since I'm going to get everything, I'm just going to nudge it over. And that should work. So um, we have a drilling operation here. That's for if you have a 5 millimeter drill. And this will do up and down peck drilling or just through drilling, however you want to set it. Um, if somebody didn't want to do a tool change, you could use a 3 16 inch bit. It's a little small of 5 millimeters. And it can do a, a helical type pocket and, and drill the hole. So let's do that. So I'm going to do a 3 16 and it's 13 millimeters deep. And I'm going to select what holes I want to use. And I'm going to set all the different shelf hole lines. And that's it. Now, I, I can do that in two passes. But if I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play with this. I'm going to say do it in one pass. It's just going to crunch down once. But I'm going to have it ramp and do a longer ramp. And so this, this ramp, and I'm just making up a value. But this, what this will do with a ramp, because I'm doing an offset rather than a, a raster, it's going to basically come down and do a circular entry all the way down at my speed that I have for my plunge rate. So that's a slow plunge rate. Um, and I'll probably bump this up to, say, 35, and then do some test holes. Now that I have this thing set up the way I want, I would want to go somewhere, and I could do them right, right here and just do some test holes and see, is it fast enough? Is it is a bit going to get hot? Things like that. But we're going to let it go like this. And call shelf holes. And there we go. We'll calculate them. Uh, reset, preview, preview. Oh, okay, there's shelf holes. They look good. They're pretty simple. But I can use that same tool if my cutter length is long enough to work on and cut the border out too. So I'll do a profile cut using the same tool outside of the line, do a separate last pass of one millimeter or so, um, and I'll add tabs to it. And I'll select the vectors that I want. I can't add tabs until I select vectors that are useful. Now I'll edit the tabs, and I'll say, go ahead and throw tabs here, across here, across here. Oop. Okay, so there's some tabs. Um, and I've already predefined the tabs and how I've got them set up. Uh, these are... English values, I don't want that, so I want to say I'm going to say 19 millimeters in length and say 7 millimeters in thickness, and I'll cut them off with an oscillating tool. Be very quick. I'll add ramps to the input cuts of 13 millimeters. That's fine. Profile cut out. And again, we'll look at our speeds of the tool itself. It's three passes, that's fine. 100 inches per minute, that'll be fine. Calculate. It's going to cut through the material. Yes, that is correct. Reset, preview all, boom, 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 there we go. There's my cabinet sides, left and right, front and back. Offsets different and in 32 millimeter increments. So that's it. Pretty simple, um, based on the old 32 millimeter increment setup. Um, we don't need to do that anymore with CNC machines because we can put our holes just where they're required, and they will be spot on every time if designed right. So if, you, if your vendor, I've, I've spoke with a couple guys that are looking at getting this smart bench, and they're looking at other machines, but they don't have support, they don't have teaching, they don't have anything to really get them running. And they've asked me in advance, um, hey, can I keep asking you questions? And he's like, yeah, no. <laughs> you need to work with vendors that can support you. So if you're looking at a brand of machines that the guys that are selling it don't know the machine well or don't know the software well, you're looking at the wrong vendors. Um, could be a good machine, but it's not going to be a good setup. The hardest thing about running CNC equipment is getting the software up and running properly and understanding it because the machine's going to do what we tell it to do. It doesn't care. It doesn't care what feeds it. It just needs to have good instructions. So, you know, although I sell CNC machines, I train customers on how to run software to make the machines make sense and make money for them. So uh, if I can help you in any way, don't hesitate to call Eric Schiller at YetiSmartBench.com, 205-871-6618. Thanks.